Okay, so in this screencast, I want to talk to you about natural selection and biological evolution. Listen, I know a lot of you cover this pretty heavily in biology, which is a good thing. I'm just doing this as a refresher in case there's something maybe you forgot, or maybe maybe somehow you uh, got through till this point in your education without learning about this, in which case, let's get on with it. So the idea basically comes down to this. Mutations in DNA are uh, a very common occurrence. They happen constantly. Every time uh, your cells reproduce themselves, there's a potential of a mutation occurring. This is something that goes wrong with the transcription of the DNA. And when this happens with, with, with sex cells, with gametes, then those mutations get passed on to offspring. And these happen randomly all the time as a result of cosmic radiation and different chemicals in our environment and just random mess ups. And so the thing is most of these mutations, even the ones we pass down in what are called germline cells to our future generations, they generally don't do anything. They're, they're, they're harmless, uh, they, they mean nothing. But every once in a while, there'll be a mutation that either makes you more likely to live or less likely to live, in which case that does end up changing the frequency at which that gene will be uh, present in future generations. So let's consider this, all right? So let's just say that we have these bugs, some of them are red and some of them are green. Nice start, Rick, huh? You're welcome. All right, I'm very proud. So, so right now, uh, there's no particular evolutionary advantage to being either red or green, but all of a sudden, let's just say, for whatever reason, the background changes to green, okay? The world turns green. In this case, being red is not so good because predators can find you very easily, and being green would be a good thing because it would be hard for predators to find you. So what happens then is over time, what we'd find is the red genes would get eliminated from the population and not get handed down, but that mutation that made this one have a green... Uh, covering, that mutation is now advantageous and it will become dominant in the population. This is called natural evolution. The species changed from being predominantly red to entirely green because of a mutation that was favored by um, what we call natural selection. So biological evolution is simply the change in the genetic makeup of organisms over time, of, of a species over time. And, and it's hard for us to imagine just the, the vastness of time. So that's one of the, the hangouts we have as a species. We, you know, we think of 100 years as about the maximum extent of a human life, but 100 years is nothing compared to the amount of time we're talking about here. So you know, these mutations are happening constantly, and given enough time, this little dog-like uh, animal that had you know, toes called Eohippus, eventually over the series of numerous mutations that got passed down, became Equus Equus, the modern horse. So we call the process by which this, is, this happens, this evolution happens, natural selection. It was first articulated by a gentleman uh, named Charles Darwin, as you're probably aware. And the idea is basically that, that traits that are advantageous to the survival of a species will get passed on to the next generation. So if, if there's a mutation that you acquire from your parents and it makes you more likely to survive to an age where you can reproduce and pass that on, then that's going to become you know, predominant in the population, that gene. But if you inherit a gene that makes you less likely to live to uh, the point of surviving to adulthood to pass it on, then that gene doesn't make it. And so uh, the bottom line is, is genes that are likely to make you survive become dominant and ones that are li make, likely to make you become uh, dead <laughs> go away. And so, so this isn't the best example of this. Uh, so let's just say though that that initially that, that, that these red ones have a mutation that makes them a little bit closer to the color of the background. So the things that want to eat them uh, will basically preferentially eat the ones that stand out more, the dark green ones. And so over time, what happens is if you have the dark green gene, you're more likely to get eaten. So you're less likely to pass that gene on to future generations. But if you have the mutated gene that makes you closer to the background cover, gives you some camouflage, then you're more likely to survive long enough to pass that on to future generations. So over time, that gene, that gene, that mutated gene becomes more dominant in the population. And we see this all the time. We've never actually watched speciation happen. We've never watched a species going from one species to the next, but we definitely see selection happening. We won't call it natural selection because we're doing it. We call it artificial selection, but it's the same idea. So if you get sick, you go to the doctor, the doctor says, oh, you have a bacterial infection. You need to take these antibiotics for 10 days. Well, here's what happens. When you first start taking all these, all these uh, uh, bacteria in your body are making you feel sick. Now, of these bacteria, the dominant uh, genotype was, was, was the red one, uh, and it is susceptible, it's highly susceptible to this, this medicine. But the blue ones represent a, a minority component of the population that have a, a randomly mutated gene that makes them resistant to that particular 
uh, uh, chemical. It doesn't make them immune from it. It just makes them less likely to die. They, 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 they're able to survive longer when exposed to it. So what happens is you start taking the pills and voila, a few days later, you feel better. You're like, I feel better. I've been taking these pills for three days. I don't need to take the rest of them. Well, the problem is this. You didn't kill all of them. Shame on you. If you kept taking them, eventually this medicine would have killed every one of them. There you are, the bacteria out of your body and there's no harm done. You've completely made the entire population in your body go extinct. Good job. Your doctor's proud of you. But what if instead you said, you yeah, know, I'm feeling fine now. I'm going to stop taking these pills. Well, look what happened. Because the blue ones had a random mutation that made them less likely to die and the red ones didn't, the red ones died at a higher rate. The blue ones survived at a higher rate. So the, the gene for resistance was selected. And so what happens is as the population moves forward and reproduces, the resistance strain becomes dominant and now our, our, our drugs don't help anymore. We get these resistance strains of bacteria. We see this happen all the time, all the time. Now, selective pressure is just a way of describing whether or not this mutation is something that uh, is going to make you survive, more likely to survive, or less likely to survive. If a mutation in a gene that is inherited makes an organism more likely to survive, it gives them some sort of advantage towards survival, then we say that there's positive selective pressure for that genetic variation. And if that mutation makes you less likely to survive, they would say there's negative selective pressure on that. So negative selective pressure means you're more likely to die and not pass on your genes. And positive selective pressure means that that, that modification, that, that random mutation gene makes you more likely to survive and pass that gene on to future generations. So again, in this case here, this mutation that gave this one a green a green color, turns out there's a, a positive selective pressure for that. So it's gonna become more dominant in the population. And there's a negative selective pressure for being red because you stand out and you're easy to eat. And so you're, you, you tend to go extinct. You tend to lose that uh, particular gene from the population. And there's a classic example of this that happened in the 1800s. So in Europe, there's a moth called the peppered moth. It had these wings that looked like salt and pepper that blend in very quite quite nicely with the lichens that grow on trees. So they they have this camouflage, and birds don't see them. But but there's just a a small component about one in a hundred moths would have this gene variant that makes them have very dark wings. So people who are interested in these moths happen to have been sampling the forest and keeping track of this. They're trying to understand genetics is why, and they they realize that they have plenty of data saying, look, about 99 out of every hundred look like this. About one out of every hundred have a random mutated gene that makes them look like this. Then people in Europe started using coal a lot, and that coal so turned the trees black. It's kind of like that, that thing with the, the bugs that you do. Now what happens is being black was had positive selective pressure. Uh, you, you're more likely to survive. And having this coloration like the lichen made you stand out. So now there's negative selective pressure. So what happens? These genes become less dominant in the population, and these genes become more dominant in the population. And you know what? People were actually collecting data so we could see that that we had about 99 out of 100 were, were had the pepper and only about one out of 100 had the, the black wings, but that all changed when, when they started burning coal. So by 1900, this had flip-flopped. Now the black ones were the dominant ones and the speckled ones were the ones that were, that were only like 1% of the population. And it stayed that way for the better part of 100 years until people said, you know what, burning coal like this is bad for the environment, let's stop doing that. And they went right back to the way they were once the trees went from black back to being covered with lichen. That is some of the most awesome scientific data I've ever seen. Now, if we let this selective process happen long enough, these, there's so much genetic change in an organism that's no longer even the same species. So even though we've never actually watched speciation occur, an organism change from one species to the other, we have every reason to believe the selective pressure given time will make this happen. But now, how do we know what constitutes a species? Well, that's definitely a matter of debate. You know, if you found like uh, the bones of a uh, a Great Dane and a Chihuahua, and you've never seen a dog before, just their bones, you'd never think they were the same species. Well, so how do you define species then? Well, the best way of defining species is to say two organisms are the same species if they can breed together and produce offspring that are also reproductive. So let's just see what I'm talking about here. So so here's a thing called, uh, so first of all, let's just say we, we decided to take a human, uh, a human egg cell and a horse sperm cell and try to make a centaur. Turns out it won't work. And there, there, there's just too much difference between uh, the chromosomal structure and the DNA in a horse and in a human. So you can't even make an offspring at all. Sorry, no centaurs. But if you took a lion and a tiger, which has been done, or a horse and a donkey, which has definitely been done, 
they're similar enough that you can actually get them to to have a, a baby. And this baby, in the case of a lion and a tiger, so it's called a liger. But this liger is not able to reproduce. It, it can't make sex cells. And so as a consequence, we say they're, they're, they're close to, but not the same species. So to be a, a species, you need to be able to be reproductive uh, and continue the generations on into the future. But look at this. Who would have thought that this Pomeranian and this wolf were the same species? But they are. You know, if you take an egg cell from the Pomeranian and a sperm cell from the wolf and you put them together in vitro, you know what? You get this uh, Pomo wolf, okay? Uh, or, or a Wolferanian or whatever you want to call it. And that that Wolferanian is capable of reproducing. So so they, even though they look very different, they're the same. Now, how is that possible? Well, it's because humans have been messing with the genes of wolves for a long time. Starting about 10,000 years ago, wolves started you know, hanging out with people in front of their caves and people basically selected those wolf puppies that were most docile, they st stayed around and the ones that were more aggressive got killed. So there was selective pressure for being, you know, uh, emotionally attached to people and kind. And there was definitely negative selective pressure for being grumpy and, and, and barking and yapping and biting. And so over time, what happened was we artificially selected so many genes that we now have this. Of course, now we, we select for specific traits, but there's still, there hasn't been enough time. 10,000 years is still not enough time to turn a, 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 the wolf into a different species. Now, life on Earth goes back a long time, okay? A, about almost 4 billion years, say 3.7 billion years with a B. That's such a long time we can't begin to fathom it. But here's the deal. If you go back far enough in time, we are all the descendant of some early, early uh, uh, prokaryotic, uh, like bacterium-like creature that over time through mutations just became everything that we know of, including ourselves. So we all have this one common ancestor and the way we got from this, this protobacteria to the diversity of life we see on the planet now is simply random mutations being selected for. So, so basically biodiversity as we know it is the result of billions of years of evolution on earth. And so what we find then is places that have high productivity like rainforests and coral reefs, uh, there's so much food availability that that there's more likelihood that offsprings are going to survive and that a mutation will, will put them in a place where they are able to, uh, a, that, that mutation will be advantageous. So we find this that uh, biodiversity tends to be highest in places that are most productive. And it tends to be low where that's not true. So if, if we look on land, like deserts are particularly unproductive areas. Well, biodiversity in deserts is very low. Why? Because the chances of your mutation uh, uh, making you more likely to survive are, are fairly low. And so when there's less when there's less food availability, there's less life and there's less opportunities to have uh, these, these random mutations that get selected for to make new species. But where, but where biodiversity is high, fascinating things happen. So in coral reefs and rainforests, what we find is that we often get species that co-evolve, that they, they become so dependent upon each other over time that, that that they're now mutually dependent on each other we call this symbiosis in particular uh, this is this this is called uh, uh, this type of <laughs> symbiosis it's not called commensalism what is it called I can't believe I forgot the name of it um, but anyway so <laughs> that's so embarrassing I'm not going to go back and redo this uh, uh, basically the these symbionts are so dependent upon each other that they can't live without each other so for instance the clownfish the clownfish lives in the sea anemones. You take away the sea anemones, it can't live, it gets eaten up. It hides in here uh, and it's very colorful, so it attracts other fish in here and then the anemone eats it. So the anemone gets a benefit from having the clownfish here because it brings it prey. The clownfish gets the, the benefit of the protection of these of these polyps here. And so the two are mutually dependent upon each other. We see the same thing with ants and aphids. We see this all, with a lot of different species. These aphids depend on these ants to protect them and to carry them to where there's new food. But if you look right here, you see this little white thing? These, these aphids produce a liquid that is the only thing these ants are capable of eating. So, so this type of, of symbiosis uh, only happens where we have a, a high diversity of life, a, a lot of productivity, which allows for life to develop in these really specialized sub-niches. I just used a word I should explain. A niche is basically a specific role in an ecosystem. So, so a niche is just basically the way an organism fits into its ecosystem. And through the process of, of, of natural selection, it's basically a niche is like the where an organism lives in the ecosystem. 
what it eats in an ecosystem, how it lives in that ecosystem. And what we find is that that evolution tends to adapt an organism to fit specifically into one particular role in that ecosystem. Uh, and, and, and we call that uh, a, a niche, the niche that it fills. So for instance, a hummingbird has this niche where uh, it has a long nose that lets it reach into a beak, lets it reach into and drink the nectar out of these flowers and pollinate them in the process. Whereas frogs, have, they, they tend to live on the water's edge uh, and, and they're, uh, they're adapted to having their eggs in the water and they have these long tongues that let them eat flying bugs. So, so they have these specialized adaptations that allow them to fill a certain, what we call niche within an ecosystem. And that's the end of this presentation.